praise the Lord. Hallelujah. More than strength, more than wisdom, more than influence, more than power, more than anything, we need to know God, the living and the true God. And God said through the prophet, he said, if you're going to boast, boast in this, that you understand and that you know me, that I am a God of righteousness and loving kindness. And God desires for us to know him. And the way that we know him is through the revelation of his word to us in the person of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So today we're continuing our series that we began a few weeks ago. Uh, and today we are talking about the goodness of God. How many of you are glad God is good? <laughs> uh, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the word. Thank you for the truth. Thank you that you're a God who's abundant in mercy and truth. And Father, I pray that you will, as we tread upon your word with humility and lightly, Lord, as you reveal to us who you are, May we be changed, may we be transformed into the people that you destined us to be in Christ. Should there be anyone here that doesn't know you yet, that doesn't understand, God, who you are, may you bring truth and revelation to bear upon their hearts and upon our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you'll open your Bibles to the Psalms and also to the book of Romans, we're going to read from Psalm 34 and Romans 11. And uh, as we begin today, uh, this aspect of the character of God, the goodness of God, I want you to know and to understand that knowing God, knowing that God is good, is paramount for your life. It is necessary if you are a Christian who hopes to grow in Christ, because without that knowledge, you will be frustrated and oftentimes even believe wrong things about God. In Psalm 34, verse 8, listen to what David, the psalmist, writes. He said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Now, he says here, Blessed is the man who trusts or relies on, or believes or trusts in the goodness of the Lord. But I want you to see that he declares something here, uh, very important, actually two things here. And he says, taste and see that the Lord is, is what? Good. The Lord is good. I want you to say that out loud with me. The Lord is good. Say it again. The Lord is is good. Now, he doesn't just make that declaration, but he also invites us, you and me, into something that is life-changing. And what is it? Well, that we are to taste the goodness of the Lord. And secondly, that we are to see or experience the Lord's goodness. And I'm going to tell you this morning, many of you are experiencing the Lord's goodness that you don't even realize the goodness that you're experiencing from God. And if you're here today or watching online and you don't know the Lord, you don't even understand the goodness of God that is in and operative in your life and you haven't even identified it or realized it yet. But hopefully today, by the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to get an enlightenment of the goodness of the Lord and you will taste and you will experience the goodness of the Lord. And then he says this, and the man who takes refuge in this good God is is blessed. <laughs> I'm a blessed man. How many blessed people do we have here today? <laughs> Hallelujah. If you take refuge in God, the good God, he says you are blessed. Now, in Romans chapter 11, if you'll go over there with me, Romans chapter 11, Paul is writing to his epistle one of the greatest books uh, ever penned by the apostle, the book of Romans. And he is talking here and explaining to the Roman church the relationship between the Jew and the Gentile in the plan of God. In other words, he is outlining what God's work is in dealing with these two groups of people. You're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. Those are only the two categories that the Bible separates mankind into. All right? And you're either a saved Jew or you're a lost Jew. 
Are you a saved Gentile or a lost Gentile? And so Paul is explaining here how these two relate in the purpose and plan of God. Go over to verse 11. In verse 11, Romans 11, 11, he says, I say then, have they, that is the Jews, have they stumbled? In other words, because they rejected Christ as their Messiah, did they stumble that they should fall? I mean, is this fall permanent? He says, certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy. Now, I want you to notice here that God is so awesome and He is so wise that He can take something, listen, something that someone does that even displeases Him or might displease Him, He even takes that and can bless people with it. I hope you heard that. He says, say they stumbled that they should fall, certainly not, because through their fall, God did something. First of all, he provoked them to jealousy, but he brought salvation to who? To the non-Jews or to the Gentiles. Now, jumped over to verse 17. Paul goes on, he says, and if some of the branches were broken off, this is again the Jewish nation, and you, Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you, the root being God. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. In other words, you say, well, the Jews, they were in disobedience and they were in unbelief. And so God, you know, cut them off, put them aside. And, and he says, so that we could come in. And so now it's all about us. And Paul's reminding us, no, 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 no. It's not all about you. It's all about the root. <laughs> the branches are the Jews and the branches are the grafted into the, uh, the wild olive tree, grafted into the olive tree are the Gentiles, but the root sustains both of them. So the important one is the root, and that is God. And so he says to them, you're going to say, well, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. He said, but because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty or proud, but fear. Now, why does he say that? Well, you have to remember that the Jews were God's covenant people in the Old Testament. They were the only nation God had a covenant with. Do you understand that? No other nation was dealt with and blessed like the nation of Israel because God decided to choose them through whom he would bring the Messiah into the world. And so they had a covenant with God. I mean, God was the father of the nation. God was the God who protected them and watched over them and, and, and saved them. And they went into unbelief, and so God cut them off. Now, you get that? Now, understanding that, Paul says, now, be don't be haughty against the natural branches, against the Jews, but fear. Now, why fear? Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, <laughs> if God didn't spare those that he had the covenant with in the Old Testament, if God didn't spare them, where do you think you stand? You don't even have covenant with God. Gentiles, they were outside of the covenant relationship with God. Paul said they were without promises, without God, and without hope in the world. So where does that leave us? Well, not in a very good place. And so Paul is making this point. Don't be haughty because the Jews that rejected Christ, so the Jews disobeyed uh, God, and God cut them off there for a season. Their, their fall isn't permanent because there's a remnant in Israel that God has chosen. But he says, verse 21, if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Woo -hoo. That's why he said, fear. Fear God. Fear God, he says. Therefore, now listen, he, he, he brings us to consider something. Verse 22, therefore, consider, consider what? Consider this. Listen, consider this. You ready? The goodness of and the severity of God. Now, the most important word there is that conjunction that joins those two things, the word and. Consider this. Think about this. 
the goodness of God and the severity of God. On those who fell, that is the Jewish people, severity. God dealt with them very severely. But toward you, what did he do? He showed his goodness. He says, to you Gentiles, God has showed you his goodness. If you continue in that goodness, he said, otherwise, because God, listen, he's no respecter of person. Don't care if you're a Jew or a Gentile. If you deal the same way they did, you'll be cut off. So he's warning us. He's telling us. And, and you know, earlier my wife said, God is good. And we all said what? All the time. And is he? Yes. God is good. But God has another aspect that goes together with his goodness. It's severity. Of course, we don't like that aspect very much. We, we, we like it when our parents as children were very good to us, right? They gave us what we wanted. They gave us what we needed. They, they cared for us. They were good to us. But sometimes they were If you didn't have a parent who was severe, you're probably a narcissist today. Yeah. If all you ever experienced was goodness and never experienced any severity from the parental side because of your disobedience and your rebellion, you are probably a narcissist today. And you think that you deserve goodness. And so Paul says, I want you to understand this. I want you to understand how God dealt with the covenant people. He cut them off because of their unbelief and their disobedience. So you fear. Yes, God is good, but he is also severe. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. Now, the goodness and the severity of God here appear together and appear together in the economy of grace, not just in the Old Testament, but now in the New Testament. And both of these aspects of God's nature must be acknowledged together. If I say together. If you're really going to truly know who God is. People say they believe in God. Well, I believe in God, but they have no idea who it really is that they believe in. There's all kinds of crazy ideas that abound today by people who don't know God, and they, they have a God in their own image. And even some Christians, crazy ideas that they believe in. And so there's a lot of confusion among people today and even so-called Christians today. But what is it that lies at the root of this problem? What is it that they have gotten wrong or has gotten them to this point in their life? Let me give you four things I believe that or answer this question. What is it got, got people to that situation? The first one is people go by religious hunches rather than learning about God from His Word. Well, I think God is like this. Well, you know, kind of, I have this idea about God, and they start giving you all their religious hunches that they have about what God is like. And some people even tell you, well, I believe in a good God. I don't believe in a God of severity at all. I don't believe God's severe at all. I believe God just loves us all. He's just a bucket of, you know, honey. Secondly, there are those who believe that all religions are equal and equivalent. And you can basically find God in all of them if you, you know, just kind of overlook some of the other things and all religions lead to God. That's another crazy idea people have. And the reason it's crazy is because it violates what Jesus said. He said, I am the way. So if you believe that, that all religions have something good and all religions will eventually lead you to God, well, you don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with Jesus. Because Jesus said, no one, who? No one can come to the Father except through me. It doesn't come through Buddha doesn't come through Allah. He doesn't come through anyone except Jesus. And now, that makes people mad. The people who believe in this God that, you know, ha they painted a picture of that's not the biblical God, they get angry when you say, well, how, why can there only be one way? Well, who are you to say, well, I didn't. Jesus did. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. The third thing is people have ceased to recognize the reality of their own sinfulness. In other words, Christians today, even Christians today, they don't think, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm a good person. I, you know, I'm not bad. I, 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 I'm a child of God. And they never acknowledge the bent towards sinfulness. But you know what? You don't have to acknowledge something that intuitively you know is true. Right? I mean, you might say, well, I, I, you know, I'm fine. I don't, you know, I don't ever do this or that or the other. And, uh, you know. But you can't hide from the things that you have inside, the conflicts that you have, the temptations that are there. You can't hide. Because God knows it and you know it. So there are people who deny the reality of their own sinfulness. So our task is to help people try to get them to accept and value the correction from the Word of God. You and I must be open to correction because we have sinful tendencies in our life. All of us do. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, I think he's talking about you too. Go ahead. Yeah. All of us do. And finally, the fourth one is that people end up with this uh, a confusion in their life about who God is, is that people have the habit of, celib- of separating, I should say, the goodness of God from the severity of God. And that will always lead you to error in understanding who God is. Back uh, in the last century, German theologians began to deny the authority of Scripture, and they infected all of Western Christianity with their ideas. And it went something like this. Well, God is a good God. I mean, He is such a honey. You know, the the God of wrath and all of that in the Old Testament and this idea that God had to send His Son and expose Him to death, you know, all of that. Yeah, it's a good story, but really that's not who God is. And, and, And the... You know, Jesus dying on the cross, that's just a story. It's just a parable. It really didn't have a lot to do with God other than, you know, kind of what we've ascribed and and we've kind of gotten things wrong. So the German theologians began to deny that the ideas of divine wrath, the, the ideas of divine judgment. And they began to teach and share and infect, as I said, Western Christianity with this idea that God is an indulgent uh, being with such goodness, but no severity at all. Now, if you've ever strayed into that path, how can you find your way back to the true path? I believe it's only by learning from the Scriptures, relating the goodness of God and the severity of God, as the Apostle Paul does here in the Scriptures, and not separating them, because to separate the goodness of God from the severity of God is an error and is a false doctrine, and it will lead you to a false theology. Listen to me. When we say God is good all the time, we're telling the truth. God is good all the time, but that's not all He is. And so when you get this idea of God where where, where one of his attributes becomes the whole, you get a lopsided view of God. You ever heard people say, well, I only believe that God is love. Well, I believe God is love too. Is that all he is? Everything God does, he does with love because that's who he is. Yes. But God's attributes are more than just love. And so sometimes people, as I said, get this idea that if you mention anything else other than love, that, that somehow you're dishonoring God. And you're actually, as Paul says here, you're actually acknowledging who He is. Behold, he says, listen, contemplate this. Look at the goodness of God that is revealed here, but also I want you to look at the severity. Look at what happened to them. Now, The German theologians who, in the last century, began to teach this liberal view of the Bible began to draw away from the Scriptures and from the infallibility of the Scriptures 
Because when you move away from the infallibility of the Scriptures, that God, the Scriptures are the Word of God. The moment you begin to say, well, you know, yeah, but, you know, we can't always trust everything the Bible says. All of a sudden, you've lost the basis upon which to make any spiritual discernment decisions. You become a God to yourself because now you can believe whatever you want about God because you don't have anything else to appeal to but your own subjective notions of God. So when they came and said, well, we can't always trust the Bible, and the Bible is this, the Bible is that, and they cut from underneath the church. The foundation upon which God reveals himself. And so now we have a God who has no anger, has no wrath. We have a God who's just all love and goodness. And so this uh, celestial Santa Claus that was created doesn't think, you know, sin's a big deal anymore. He doesn't make a big thing about sin anymore. And that's why even these theologians came and began to write books and, and expound the idea that, you know, when you read about Jesus, you read about Jesus talking about the Heavenly Father. He loves you and the Heavenly Father, you know, he's this and that. And, and, yet, and then he says, and now you read about this God in the Old Testament who is angry and wrath and judgment. And, and he says, and that's not the same Father that Jesus was talking about. So that's why we can't trust the Bible. Is that true? Some people believe it. But I, I always tell people, if you don't believe the God of the Old Testament is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament, you haven't read the Bible well. You haven't understood yet the spiritual message of the Bible. You haven't understood the character and the nature of God. Now, this uh, celestial Santa Claus that people conjure up in their own mind is all good and he always ready to give gifts, and matter of fact, his goodness and his favor extends to those who disregard his commands as well as those who keep them. So there really isn't any difference of where you are because God is so good that he really doesn't care whether you keep his commandments or you don't. You say, people actually believe that? Oh, yeah, in practice they do. But this theology of this celestial Santa Claus God is useless because it can't cope with the fact and the problem of evil and the effects of sin. See, because if God only has to do with good things, then how do you explain evil? How do you explain suffering and misery? If God doesn't have anything to do with those things, as people, some people say, well, God doesn't have anything to do with that. I mean, God only has to do with blessing and good and, and just all goodness. And what they don't realize is that they cut off the sovereignty of God, that God is in control of everything. And I told you last week, one of the questions that unbelievers ask and atheists ask, if you believe in a good God, and how can he allow evil? If he has the power, as you say, if he's all powerful and he's good, why doesn't he do something about evil? Why does he allow it to go on? Maybe he doesn't have the power that you think he does. So goes the argument. The only way to save, I believe, this liberal view of God is to disassociate him, according to them, from evil, is to disassociate God from anything that's destructive or cruel or even death itself, to deny that he has any direct relationship to any of these things, actually, as I said, undercuts his sovereignty and his lordship over all the world. So the person who believes this is left with a God who means well, but he just doesn't have the power to protect his children from trouble and from grief or even from death. So when trouble comes, the person who believes in this celestial Santa Claus, all they can do is grin and bear it. Well, we don't know. <laughs> and so people who believe in a God who is all goodness and no severity really confine themselves to a life of hopelessness. Because if God doesn't have anything to do with these, and he doesn't really have anything to do with this, all these other stuff, that destruction and death, if he doesn't have anything to do with that, that means he's not involved in it. And so, I don't know. I just, God is good, but I don't know what all that is. <laughs> so this God that has been 
made into a caricature of the real God leaves us just kind of grinning and bearing it, like I said. This is why, folks, I tell you over and over, it's important what you believe. Doctrine is important. Theology is important. Right theology. Because if you don't study the Bible, you have no basis upon which to discern true from false. If you don't understand the teaching of the Scripture, if you don't study it, if you don't discern what the Scripture has to say, then you're going to be food for false teachers. And this is why we believe that God has called us here in this church to teach the Bible. I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm here to teach you what the Scripture says about God so that you can be strong no matter what happens. Because you know whom you have believed in. And you know who He is. In Exodus 33, I want you to go over there with me real quick. God comes to, or excuse me, Moses comes to God in his encounters with God and he asks him to show him his glory. In Exodus 33, excuse me, verse 19, God promises Abraham that he's going to make something pass before him. And we read in verse 19, this something is his goodness. He says to him, I will make all my goodness, note that, pass before you. What's going to pass before you? My goodness. Don't forget that. I'm going to make my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now, it's notice that that notice that he talks about his goodness passing before him. But before he shows him that, he makes this statement, which Paul actually quotes in Romans chapter 9. God said, I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will be merciful to whom I will be merciful. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. You see, the people that say, well, Jesus isn't the God that Jesus talked about in the, in the New Testament. Jesus in the New Testament, God himself, he was so loving. He was just full of love. I mean, you know, he, it couldn't be the same God in the Old Testament because the God of the Old Testament here is kind of, you know, he's, he's kind of severe, right? What do you mean you're going to have uh, grace to whom you want to have grace and compassion with whom you want to have compassion? Why don't you have grace and compassion with everybody? You see, if it was Jesus, now if that was Jesus, Jesus would say, oh, man, I love everybody. I'm going to be grace to everybody. Just grace overall, right? Compassion, oh, here it is, Shh, everybody. So this God, yeah, yeah, I don't know who that is. Well, let me take you to the New Testament. And Jesus comes in his teaching and he says, no one knows the Father except the Son. No one knows the Son except the Son. The Father. Now listen, he says this, no one knows the Father except the Son, talking about himself, and whomever he chooses to reveal him. Wait, 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 what did you say? Jesus, he said, you can't know the Father, only I know him. And I reveal him to whomever I please. Well, well, that's not the same Jesus I believe in. I believe Jesus is so good and full of love that he'll reveal it to everybody. Was that what he said? No. If he did that, then that does, those words he, right there don't mean anything. If he says, I reveal him to whomever I will. I will. Talking about his own will. Whomever I will, I'll reveal the Father. And listen, if you're a Christian today and you know the Lord, guess what? He will to reveal him to you. And as a result of that, you're blessed. Who do men say that I am? He said one time to his disciple, Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. My Father in heaven revealed that to you. See, you couldn't have known that except my Father revealed it to you. And then what did he say? You are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah. 
Why were you blessed? Because my Father revealed something to you. You can know by yourself. That's why I said, if you're a believer today, God, Jesus has revealed a Father to you because he will too. And you know what I say? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for showing the Father to me. Thank you, Lord, for opening my eyes to see and my ears to hear. Now go to the next chapter, Exodus 34. So he said, I'm going to pass my goodness before you. Now let's look at what is that goodness. And the Lord passed before him, verse 6, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Now notice, what did he say? I'm going to make my goodness pass before you. And now he begins to describe that goodness. Listen, gracious, I am full of grace. I'm merciful. I'm long-suffering. I'm abounding in good. Not just good, but I'm abounding in goodness and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands. I'm a God who forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. Aren't you glad for that? That's the goodness of God. Wait, wait, wait. He's not finished yet. Here's the severity. And by no means do I clear guilty people. What? I thought you were good. Well, listen. A good judge, you go before him. If he's a good judge and you're guilty, he's not going to clear you. But, 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 but you're my uncle. Sorry. The law says you broke the law. Here's what the law says, and here's what. That's a good judge. Now, a corrupt judge, you say, well, yeah, he's my nephew. Okay, well, I'm going to act like it's not that bad. <laughs> I'm going to let you off. Right? Or make some kind of, you know, twisting of the law to make it mean something different. But God said, listen, here's my goodness. I forgive, I have mercy, I, I, you know, and, and I forgive sin, but I don't clear the guilty. And not only that, but I'll visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. <gasps> you say, man, that's pretty strong. That's pretty severe. Yes. Because God is good and his severity it's part of his nature and his character because he is just and he will not allow the guilty to be cleared if they are guilty. Aren't you glad for that? Sometimes people say, well, you know what, that person, man, he, he lived, he came on the, on, on the world scene and, and because of his policies and because of his, he killed millions of people and just kind of died and got away with it. No, he didn't. You think Idi Amin got away with destroying millions of lives? You think that Mao Zedong, who killed millions of his own people, do you think he got away with it? No, brothers and sisters, he's waiting in hell, waiting for God to pass the sentence because he doesn't clear the guilty. That's the severity of God. And as a matter of fact, If you are the victim, looking at the severity of God and the justice of God for punishing evildoers, you're over here saying, that's good. Right? That's good that he doesn't allow injustice to go on forever. God will not allow injustice to go on forever. So all these things... Make up the goodness that God promised Moses would pass before him. Abounding in goodness. What does that mean? There's another word that, we, that describes the goodness of God, and that's the word generous or generosity. God is generous in his forgiveness. He is generous in his mercy. He is generous in his grace. He is generous in his long-suffering. He is generous in his compassion. God is generous. That's what we mean when we say God is good. The Latin theologians 
use the phrase ultra bonus, which means he's ultra good. God is overflowing in goodness. And the Reformed theologians stuck more with the Bible words. They use the word grace. Everybody say grace. They use the word grace, and they said this defines every divine act of goodness comes from the grace of God. It covers every one of His generous acts toward men. And then they said the Bible talks about a gracious God, but also a God who is severe in His dealing with sin. And so, how do we not fall into this error of, well, God is good. I just believe God is good and, you know, all the other things. Well, you know, he's just going to let them slide. No, he can't because he is just. God cannot allow injustice to continue because it challenges the justice that he has and he is. And so, one day God is going to judge every sin. And every sin that's not covered by the blood, you'll have to pay for if that's you. But if you are covered by the blood of Jesus, thank God that sin has already been paid for and it has been dealt with. Glory to God. Now listen, the, divi- the, the theologians, the reform schools talk about grace and they made distinctions in this grace. You need to understand this because, and, and this will bless you. They said, well, God is good to everybody. And so they talk about grace, that is common grace, God grace, uh, gracing everybody in the whole world. They talk about, they made the distinction about common grace and special grace. And they said common grace is the grace and the goodness that God shows in all of his creation to everybody everywhere. It is the goodness that God continues to minister in the preservation of His creation. And common grace is what God grants all human beings in all the blessings of this life. That's common grace. But they said there's another aspect that the Bible talks about the grace of God, and that's special grace. That is the grace that is manifested in the economy of salvation. Now, the contrast between these two, common grace and special grace, is that everyone, everybody say everyone, everyone benefits from common grace, the saved and the unsaved. In Matthew 5, 45, Jesus said that God makes His Son rise on the just, or on the good, rather, and on the what? On the evil. In other words, when you got up this morning and you, and you opened your windows and you saw the sunlight and you say, oh, man, it's going to be a nice day. Look at the sun. And you went out and you said, oh, man, this is nice. It feels good, right? You got light. That sun is a blessing from God. It is common grace given to everybody, not just you because you're a Christian. Your neighbor who doesn't know the Lord, perhaps, he got up and he saw the same sun and he said, oh, man, it's going to be a nice day today. The difference is that you know where that blessing of that sun comes from. And they just kind of, well, it's the sun. (laughs) And he makes the rain, he says, he sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. So the same rain that blesses you and refreshes your yard, refreshes the yard of your neighbor who might not know the Lord or might even be an atheist and might even curse God. But he gets the same rain. You have children, and you enjoy, how many of you enjoy your children, right? You enjoy your children, you love them, and they come, and you, you, know, you embrace them, and you have oh, this feeling that you get, oh, man, these are my kids, I love them. The same person, the, you know, the, the, your neighbor who might not know the Lord has his kids. He feels the same way about it, his kids. And he gets that same love feeling. They might not even know the Lord, but they love their kids, and they, oh, man, they get this feeling, oh, my kids, oh, man, you know. They don't know the Lord. But the ability to enjoy love and to be loved is a common grace gift. Why? Because God is good. Now, the contrast between common grace and special grace, the way to proclaim it, the way to understand this, 
is in two ways. First of all, everyone benefits from common grace, I said. But not all benefit from special grace. That's reserved for God's kids. That's reserved for the saved. Now, the biblical way to proclaim this distinction, and uh, you might want to write this down or you might want to remember it. God is good to all in some ways. That's common grace. But God is good to some in all ways. That's special grace. Let me repeat it to you again. God is good. He's good to everybody. But he's good in all or to all in some ways only. And he is good to some, that's you and me if we're saved, in all things and in all ways. Because we benefit from special grace, not just common grace. So you get common grace and special grace if you're a Christian. Now, God, go over to Psalm 145. He shows his benefits, his goodness in common grace to everybody, saved and unsaved. He makes his son rise on the good and the evil, his reign to come on the just and the unjust. He blesses everybody that way. Again, that's grace, that's God's goodness demonstrated to all of his creation. And so God blesses in common grace, in natural blessings to all of his creation. Look at Psalm 145 verse 9. The Lord is good to who? To all. You see, that's what I'm saying. He's good to everybody. Except he's good to all in common grace in some things. And he's good to some in all things. There's the distinction. God's good. to he's, The Lord is good to all. Let's look at it. His tender mercies are over what? All his works. Now, are you part of that work? Yeah, he created you, didn't he? All right, so you get mercy. Now, do you think people who don't know the Lord, do you think they get mercy? Lots of it. Because if God were to judge them right now, and they don't know Christ, they'd all go to hell. So God is still in the extension of their life, providing them mercy so that they can come to repentance. So he said, God is good to all. Verse 15, the eyes of all look expectantly to you. Listen, this is the goodness of God. And you give them their food in due season. Verse 16, you open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Now notice here, this is the goodness of the Lord. Remember, the Lord is good to all, common grace. God's showing his generosity and his goodness and the natural blessings that he provides for everybody. And what does he say in verse 15? You give them their food. You give them their food. How many of you like to eat? How many of you, when you're hungry, and then, you know, they make you a real, your favorite dish, and you, and you eat it, and you're like, ah, man, that was good, right? Man, that was awesome. Uh, we, we had the Hawaiian luau the other night, and, and I got to taste for the first time some things that I'd never eaten, and I thought, oh, my God, this is good. Ah, listen, when you eat, he gives food. Food brings you satisfaction. Notice, he satisfies the desire of every living thing. So I want to have a nice bacon cheeseburger. I say, I can go to Whataburger and get me a double. Make it a triple. Right? (laughs) With bacon and cheese. Want one or two on it? Give me two. What about the fries? You want to upsize them. I mean, and you sit down, you say, I'm going to eat this burger, man. And you eat it, and you eat your fries, and you finish, and you go, oh, man, man, that was good. Guess what? That was a gift of God's goodness. The fact that you have food to eat is a testimony, it is a witness that God is good to you. Do you realize that there's people right now that don't have anything to eat? But you do. 
As a matter of fact, if you're hungry for something, you just go to H-E-B and pick it up and cook it and say, oh, man, that was good. But we never stop to think that God opened his hand to us and satisfied our desire. Whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian. Because non-Christians enjoy food just as much as Christians do. They just don't thank God for it. They just think, well, I work hard and my money bought it. He gives them their food. That's part of his goodness. Remember, the Lord is good to all. His tender mercies over, his, over all his works. He gives them food. He opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. And you can think about anything. You know, man, the desire. If you're a, if you're a young mother, you desire, you know, for, for family. God, thank you for that desire. It is your goodness. Maybe you have a desire, you know, to, I don't know, to open a business and be successful. Thank you, God for that desire. He fulfills the desire. Come on, grace. And he gives that to people that don't even deserve it. Whether you're his kid or not, God blesses you with common grace. Look at Acts chapter 14. Here's another example. We give many of them from Scripture, but I just want you to see some of these examples. In Acts 14, 17, nevertheless, he did not leave himself, God, talking about God, without what? Without what? So God gave a witness, all right? Here it is, in that he did good. Why? Because he's good to all. And what does he do? He gave us rain from heaven. You see, instead of saying, oh, man, we're going to have a picnic. Oh, man, it's going to rain. Man, God ruined our day. (laughs) Wait, 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 what? Yeah, I mean, you know, at least he could have stopped the rain. Wait, wait. The rain is a witness that God is good to you. You've ever lived parched and never lived in a place where there was no water? You know how valuable water can be. But because we live in a place where we have it all, we don't ever think very much of it. But just let water fail. Let it fail for a few days and see what we all do. Right? Right? I'd be coming over to your house looking to see if you got any water. But he says, listen, he didn't leave himself without a witness. What is that witness? Well, he, he did good. He gave us rain from heaven. And fruitful seasons. Filling our hearts with food and <sighs> gladness. Do you see that? The physical food that God provides for you and the feeling Or the gladness of heart that you get because you're satiated, you're full, are gifts from God's goodness. And it is a witness that he is good to you. So you can never stand before God at judgment and say, well, why did you ever do for me? What did you ever do for me, God? Uh, Well, I gave you food to eat. Uh, I made the rain come so that you could have fruitful seasons and you could have Things that would fill your heart. I gave you children that delighted your soul. There's my witness that I'm a good God. And I did all that even though you didn't deserve it. So the point of the psalmist here is that God being sovereign, God controlling all the world, and knowing that, he says, listen, every pleasure... Every possession, every meal, every ray of sunshine, every moment of health and safety, everything that enriches your life is a gift from God. Do you understand that? It is from the good hand of God. I wonder if you've ever acknowledged or offered thanksgiving lately for those good things. As I was preparing for this, I was reminded of a song we used to sing when we were kids, when we were young, the church that my parents were raised us in. And some of you that are aged would probably remember this. Let me give you some of the lines of the song. 
See if I can remember the tune. When upon life's billows you are tempted, tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your, bl count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see, I lost my tune, what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be disheartened, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. I want to challenge you this morning. And maybe today, maybe sometime this week, to sit down in your time with God, take out a piece of paper or a notebook, and begin to write down every good thing that God allows and has brought into your life. I thank God that I got up this morning. I thank you, God, that I can breathe fully because there's some today who can't. I thank you, God, that I have strength in my legs to walk around. I thank you, God, for my children that you've given me. I thank you, God, that I got up this morning and breakfast is waiting for me. I thank you, God, that I have clothes to wear and shoes, that I don't have to walk on rocks and without any shoes or protection. I thank you, God, for my health. I thank you, God, that I have a place to call home. I thank you, God, that you have saved me. I thank you, God, that you keep me. I thank you, God, for my siblings. I thank you, God, for my parents who showed me the way. I thank you, God, that I'm healthy. I thank you, God. And you're going to discover something. God has been good to you more than you know. And we choose rather to see what we don't have and what we're lacking and why don't I have this and why don't I have that? When is God going to give me this and when am I going to have that? And it shows how little we know of God's character. Count your blessings one by one. And you're going to discover something about God and something about yourself. And you're going to fall on your knees if you have any humility at all. And say, God, you've been so good to me. More than I deserve. You ought to do that every so often so that you don't forget how good God has been to you. And that's just in common grace. 
God's goodness also extends to redemptive blessing. David wrote in Psalm 107, verse 1 and 2, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom the Lord has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. What do we say? We say the Lord is good, and His mercy towards me is forever. You remember He spoke about over there in, in Exodus, I will be merciful to whom I will be merciful. I decide. But because I am a recipient of special grace, God's mercy towards me is forever. That's the blessing of a child of God. Only few get that blessing. And that's why he said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. In Psalm 100, verse 4 and verse 5, he writes, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good. Again, he repeats it, and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. I am so thankful that I have the truth of God in the Scripture and that He has given me His Spirit to reveal His truth to me. Others don't get that, but I get that. That's the goodness of God towards me. And it's forever. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter writes, so put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Put those things away, he says, and like newborn infants long for the pure milk, spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. What is he saying? If you have a desire for the things of God that cause you to grow in salvation, if you have a desire for the milk of the Word of God, it is because you have been given the privilege of tasting the goodness of the Lord. That's why I tell people, so how do you know you're a Christian? If you have no desire for the Word of God or the things of God, you're not you must come and taste of the goodness of the Lord. But when you taste it, he says, it gives you the desire to grow in the salvation that God has given to you so freely and so graciously. Can you say praise the Lord? God's goodness transforms lives, human lives. And so Paul, excuse me, David ends in Psalm 107, one of the last verses of 107, Psalm verse 43. He said, whoever is wise will observe these things, and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Whoever is wise will observe these things. What things? Well, the things he talks about in Psalm 107, the things that he reveals there, and they will understand the goodness or the loving kindness of the Lord. And here, I want to give you another part of homework, all right, for this week. The first one is to make a list of all the blessings. Count them one by one. As many as the Holy Spirit shows you, reveals, write them down and you're going to see how good God has been to you. And the second thing I want you to do is go and read this week. Or maybe today when you, when you sit down with your family to eat, and before everybody chows down, open up Psalm 107 and read it. And read it to yourself and read it to your family. David says, oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness. And for the wonderful works to the children of men. Oh, that men would praise the Lord. And he mentions four different deliverances that God brings to his people there in Psalm 107. And so that would be your homework. Read Psalm 107. And read it, listen, read it maybe in a paraphrase translation. Get a little bit more of the sense of what is being said there. Maybe read it in the New Living Translation. And make your list, counting your blessings one by one. I want to close here in Romans chapter 11, where I started, because you might be here today and you're not even sure where you stand with God, that today God is calling you to call upon Him who is good to all who call upon Him. And again, Paul writes in Romans chapter 11, verse 20, 
talks again about the same Jew and Gentile plan of God that he's talking about. He said, well said, because of unbelief, they, Israel, were broken off. And you stand by faith, he says. Do not be haughty, do not be proud, but fear, fear the Lord. And he says, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Verse 25, excuse me, verse 22, therefore consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who failed severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Listen, you might be here today in this auditorium. You might be watching online. You don't know where you stand with God. Well, God says, listen, you've got to consider his goodness, but you also got to consider that God is also a God of severity. In Psalm 86, verse 5, David wrote, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive. Ready to what? To forgive. You might be standing there and say, I don't know where I stand with God. Well, you need God's forgiveness. And God is good. And part of that goodness is He's willing to forgive you. He's abundant in mercy to all those who what? Who call upon Him. And so I'm going to challenge you today to call upon the Lord. Would you bow your head with me today right here where you are? And you might be here, don't know where you stand with God. Call upon Him. And tell Him, God, I missed all the goodness. I missed the testimony in my own life, of the goodness that you brought in my life, and I didn't even know it. I didn't even discern it because my eyes were shut. But thank you for opening my eyes. And today I call upon your name, call upon him, telling me merciful to me, a sinner. And God, I want to be on the goodness side and not the severity side as the Jews that were cut off. And you said if I would come, I could experience the goodness of God. And Lord, to fear because if you did not spare the natural branches, you will not spare those who live the same way they did in unbelief. And so today, tell him, today, Lord, come into my life, forgive my sins, and help me, Lord, to live and to walk in your goodness forever. I call upon you and I thank you for responding to my prayer and the cry of my heart. I believe that you're good and your mercy endures forever. And I thank you for that mercy, God. And if you're a believer today, thank him right there where you are that you brought me to repentance, which is a manifest evidence of your goodness, that you saved me in Christ, another aspect of divine goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you've forgiven all my sins. And as we read here in the psalm, it is because you are good and abundant in mercy. And so, Father, thank you today for those that begin their journey and those that continue our journey, Lord, in the knowledge of the good God. I thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. The Lord bless you.